dear all, uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Professor Eric uh, Edmonds. Um, Eric Edmonds is a professor of economics at Dartmouth College, research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a fellow at the Bureau of Research and Economic Analysis of Development in Cambridge, research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany, and editor-in-chief of the World Bank Economic Review. Eric has been working on child labor uh, issue for more than 20 years, lots of publication, has been extensively advisory uh, advisor on issues related to child labor and forced labor, uh, for a variety of international organization and the US uh, government also. Um, and Eric, uh, really thank you so much for being part of uh, our community, for having helped us uh, through the process of uh, uh, giving the grants and the fellowship uh, and also for following up with the students uh, and uh, last but not the least for being with us today. I will leave it to you, Eric, and um, enjoy the, the listening, Eric, to the, the <laughs> attendees. Thanks so much for that introduction. Let me get my slides going here. All right. Um, Lorenzo, would you mind just confirming that we've got a nice full screen image there? No, I think you have to um, switch because I see also the note on the next uh, slide. Lorenzo, thanks so much for that um, introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. I really appreciate um, your leadership, Lorraine, your leadership, and, and everybody who's been involved in this project. Um, it's been, uh, you know, for me personally, really rewarding, um, and I hope we'll have more opportunities to continue to, to grow the family that are, are working on these important issues um, uh, over time. So um, today I'm in a, I was asked to give a talk of, about translating um, research to action. And so you're gonna note that today is like heavy, heavy on personal anecdote. Um, I think I'm probably maybe the oldest person here, Lorenzo. I don't know. Um, we're, we're, we're in the argument. Uh, we're, we're competing with each other. But um, uh, I'm going to you know, kind of pepper a lot of what I'm talking about, about translating research to action with my own experiences. And you know what? I'm no expert here, right? I've just done it for a long time. Um, and so hopefully some of the things I've seen are useful for others, but I won't claim this to be universally truth. Um, we spent a lot of time doing research so that everything isn't informed by anecdote, and here I'm going to have a talk that's entirely anecdote. So um, I hope that that, uh, that still uh, leads to some, um, some useful discussion at the end um, of the talk. And so that's the basic plan. I'll, I'll give my sort of thoughts on translating research to action. Um, and then at the end, we'll kind of have time for Q&A where I hope you'll share some of your thoughts and, and experiences as well. Um, in, in trying to do that. So the basic problem, um, as I see it, is that uh, academic research is generally speaking written for academics. Um, it's kind of an obvious point, um, but it's the incentives that we who are academics, um, and when I say we throughout this talk, I'm going to refer generally to, to academics producing research, um, first and foremost, as a part of their job uh, based in a university. The research that we do is written for an academic audience. That's because we're evaluated based on our publications in those academic journals. Those academic journals are run by academics and the people who read those academic journals are by and large academics. And so um, you have uh, a structure that's gonna be a little insular here. Um, and you know, within individual disciplines, there are clear lines of engagement and communication, things that are thought to be important at one point in time that aren't necessarily important for a broader audience, um, but that are very important at that point in the advancement of a particular science. In my case, it's gonna be economic science, but I know we, um, and I'm happy that we have people from a lot of different um, disciplines here. I don't think that this is something that's uniquely problematic for economics. I think all of us that are academically based are writing for an academic market. We get evaluated based on our publications where other academics read our papers and, and think about them. Problem is we're greedy. 
we're greedy in the sense that we want a larger audience. And I, and I you know, this is just an assertion, but I, I bet it's right for all of us um, that are here today, which is that everybody that's engaging in these policy directed um, topics, especially, you know, if we're spending our time working on issues that are, that are I think, have uh, such vulnerable people behind the data, um, we aren't doing it just so that other academics can be impressed by us or can read what we've written, right? We're ultimately wanting a policy engagement. Um, we're wanting our research to, to inform and, and help these vulnerable populations that we focus on. The problem is like we kind of take an attitude and this has certainly been the case for me throughout almost my entire career whether it's sort of like a, the if I do it people will find it and it will be useful right um I, there's a, 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 a yeah that's that's I think kind of the basic idea is that by virtue of just doing the research somehow it's going to have policy engagement somehow it's going to have a bigger audience than the academic readership of my particular journal um, and it's just going to magically happen. And that's really unrealistic. And it's really unrealistic because um, folks that are involved in formulating policy in this space, and I, I bet it's true in every space, um, are really, really busy, you know, um, and they're struggling to get stuff done um, uh, within the limited amount of time that there exists in a day. You know, the volume of work that needs to be done is so much bigger than the amount of time of the people that are trying to do it that um, it's simply unrealistic to think people are going to spend a lot of time finding my research when I'm, I'm writing a, a academic paper. And so, you know, I kind of think of two basic reasons why um, it becomes hard for, for policy to find the, the output that academics are working on. One is that there's search costs, you know, people are busy and there's a lot of people writing research papers, a lot of academic papers generated. And so, um, you know, it's just costly for busy people to find the research that's most relevant to their particular needs. And the issue that I think is actually even more important than search costs, but in terms of real world impact interacts is there's confirmation bias, which is there's a lot of research out there. Um, what are people going to, what are policymakers going to do? What are they gonna turn to? They're gonna look for research that shows a particular point that they wanna make because that's, they don't have time to, sit and ponder um, great questions in life, right? By and large, they're trying to get their work done. They're trying to achieve their goals. Um, and when they need research, they're gonna quickly um, look for it. And they're gonna look for research that makes a point that they wanna make. And I'll give you an example of this that really struck home um, recently. As I was um, sitting in a meeting with a uh, international organization that, um, was trying to develop a set of, of labor standards um, to that they would apply in certifying a particular good as being child labor free. They wanted to have a kind of a definition of those standards that would be applied that would lead to that certification. And um, one of the members of the expert panels um, was making a, basically a point that those of us that have sat in these have all heard that, um, you know, oh, um, if you do, you know, one of the big benefits of child labor is that people develop skills that are really important later in life. And so I asked the question, like in this context, kind of what's, what's the evidence that's like making you think that, you know, 13 year olds are better off doing this activity that I think most people would consider hazardous. And uh, they quickly Googled and typed in, you know, benefits of this activity for children and found the first thing that came up and cited that. Um, and that was kind of like what the, you know, an example of how research gets used, right? The person wanted to make a point. They weren't making the point because of the research. They were using the research to help um, support an argument that they were making. And I certainly have had a, a lot of experiences where when I have findings that go a particular direction, they get a lot of policy traction. And if they go the different direction, they get no policy traction, um, even if they're the exact same findings with just kind of different um, underlying sources of variation that lead to positive or negative outcomes. And so that kind of confirmation bias for consumers of research, uh, I think is really central. And it's in part an artifact that, you know, people are really busy and um, they, they want to use research to support their experiences. And so 
that from an academic research perspective is really unfortunate because we want we want our research to change people's minds change how they think about problems and there's kind of a couple of solutions that are really um, commonplace today uh, one is that um, we will have people write kind of curated bibliographies or databases and I recently um, have been involved in a, in a lot of um, um, some of these that I'm very proud of. Um, and I think the basic idea of these kind of curated bibliographies is they help reduce people's search costs. Like now, you know, and if you were to go into Google Scholar and you type child labor, you're going to get something, you know, in the order of 20,000 hits or something like that. Well, how do you search through that? You could go to a curated bibliography. Um, like the one that um, ILO and IOM recently produced and um, find paper there. A couple of limitations to this curated bibliography problem of, of translating academic research to, to a broader policy community. One is that there still are, it reduces search costs, um, but there still are search costs and you gotta know what to search. You know, if you've got 500 papers in, in um, a recent bibliography, you can't look through all 500, right? You're still going to be looking for a particular paper that makes a particular point. So you still have confirmation bias. And the other bigger problem is it's really hard to keep it up to date. Personally, you know, I don't have the constraints of, um, um, of a lot of you, and yet, Every time I get asked to do a bibliography, I decide afterwards, I'm going to keep this up to date. I'm not going to let it fall behind. I'm going to always kind of keep adding to it just on my own. Never done it in 22 years. Tried to do it over and over again. Always mean to do it, but never actually managed to do it. Um, it's just costly to keep these up to date, which is why we keep getting, getting new ones. Um, that seems like an imperfect solution, and we still have that confirmation bias problem. The other sort of thing that you see people do to help translate research to, to policy is translational writing. And then there, I, I think this fundamentally kind of misdiagnoses the problem a bit. It sort of assumes that like policymakers can't understand academic research. And that's not true. They can, they just don't have the time to wade through it all and to consume it all and to differentiate out the things that academics are particularly obsessed with at that moment from what they really need to know to make their decisions. And so I don't li like this notion in general um, uh, that's behind translational writing as if you know, somehow people aren't able to, to understand the academic research. They can understand it, they just don't have time to deal with it. Um, and what often happens in translational writing is you move away from issues around context and the appropriateness of the research methodology and the validity of the design to just pull summaries out of the paper. And I think that um, that eliminates a lot of the important nuance that any policymaker that's looking to extrapolate from a body of research should be should be interested in and should want to know about, um, and does want to know about, but doesn't have the time. And you know, even with translational writing, the reality of it is, is yeah, it might be a two-page, a one-page summary of a paper is easier to read than a twenty-page paper but there still ends up being a lot. You still have search costs. You still have a limited amount of time. And you're gonna have confirmation bias problems as people look for research that, that shows a particular finding. So what's the solution here? I think the solution is for those of us doing academic research, um, not to produce even more things for policymakers to read, but to really start approaching policy engagement in the same way that we approach academic engagement. What do you do if you're an academic researcher and you're starting a, um, a, a new project? You talk to people who've worked in that area, right? You um, collect some expertise, some experience at the design stage of your study. You get a sense of what the market for that academic study is going to be. What kind of a journal could you publish in? What are the issues you need to pay attention to? I think we need that same sort of approach at the design stage to policy engagement. So try to start engaging policymakers at the design stage. Um, this will help inform the questions that you as an academic researcher are asking, um, just like you know, when you talk to your academic peers at the design stage of a research paper, you, you sort of expand the set of questions that you're, you're worried about. And this outreach itself has value. 
first is I think learning how to ask questions is something that gets better and better, that you get better and better at over time. And a lot of folks who are involved in child labor policy don't have the time to really get used to how to define research questions. And so by engaging policymakers early in the process, there's kind of an outreach that goes on as they engage in that question and answer back with you. Um, you know, there, there's sort of, um, uh, you could think of it as, um, as uh, outreach, although you as an academic researcher are also benefiting from it. But um, I think that the more people are involved in asking questions, the more people get used to asking questions at the earliest stages of a project, the better we all are at understanding the utility and sometimes complete lack of utility of those projects. I think having that discussion about research questions, having that discussion about trying to formulate what we know and what we don't know helps identify sources of confirmation of a bias. And then most importantly, it creates some investment in the research results, okay? That's one thing that like I've often experienced is you'll go into a busy office in the Ministry of Education in Rajasthan and you'll tell them what you found and they'll say thank you very much and they'll leave <laughs> and that's it. And then your paper gets filed in, in, in a trash bin. But if folks are involved from the very beginning, if they're engaged and they're curious, they're not going to be able to stay continuously involved. But that initial Q&A and curiosity peak will help make them more interested in the research at the very at the very end too. You know, and I think it's important when you do this to be prepared to potentially have an additional deliverable beyond your academic research paper that's tailored to what the policymaker needs. But because they're involved at the very beginning, maybe they can give you some sense as to what that's going to look like. What is it they really do, do need at the end instead of them trying to ex post search through a lot of different things. Okay, so that sounds very intuitive, right? Let's treat our policy market the same way we treat our academic market if we want the policy market to consume our papers. The question is, how do we achieve it? Right? Devil's always in the details. Certainly true here. You know, right now, what can you do? Cold outreach. You know, you can try to contact maybe via LinkedIn, maybe via web searches, maybe via people that you know and have a virtual coffee with folks that are you think would potentially be consumers of the end part of your project. It's not going to be very effective. Effective, although you know I think my students have a long history of uh, reaching out to people via LinkedIn and getting you know lots of people willing to spend 15 minutes um, talking to them. I know I talk to dozens of high school students each month that are working on projects um, related to child labor. I can spare the 15 minutes. And um, how do they get in touch with me? Cold outreach. People are generally happy to talk to you um, at least once for a few minutes. Um, but more broadly, like cold outreach is not a long-term solution to this problem. What do I think we can do? Matchmaking events are nice. They help build personal relationships. Um, they're probably not a long-term solution here as they take up so much time, um, but they can maybe get things started. Um, beyond that, organizations like the folks involved in this event could start trying to act more as facilitators. You know, um, Lorraine, Lorenzo have a lot of time engaging with policymakers in a variety of different countries. It would be great if we could find ways to support their ability to kind of help make an initial match, make matchmaking um, happen on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, you know, these things don't need to be long, extensive communications. People can generally ex spend time for a virtual coffee, especially now with these kind of Zoom technologies. And it would be great if we could facilitate more of that at the very early stages of projects to sort of try to, you know, make sure that they're relevant, make sure that they feel useful. And I think all of this is an alternative to policy-directed research. And the reason why I'm a little bit down on policy-directed research is that often policy-directed research has its own sets of, you know, it's the people are being directed to work on a particular topic and their deliverable doesn't have to meet the same standards of peer review that academic research has to meet. And so I think the extent that we can get people who can leverage peer review to help make the research um, more robust and leverage their own communication and outreach to make it also more applied, I think that's kind of a, a potential sweet spot where we can have the best of, of both worlds that I hope, hope we'll be able to achieve in the future. Um, so now I have a few kind of reflections on my own um, personal lessons here on policy engagement as we think about like, okay, well, let's say I'm going to have a virtual coffee 
um, with someone if I'm working on a project in Uganda, maybe I've managed to find someone involved in, in child labor related policy in the Ministry of Labor in Uganda, and I've persuaded them to have a, a you know, 15 minute virtual coffee with me. What are things that, that are important to know? I think the first thing that's really important to know that I was very surprised in, surprised about in my own experience, is I always thought kind of people who were working in child labor policy would have a strong sense of what are the questions out there that we need to know? What do we not know? But if you think about it, that was an incredibly naive assumption on my part, because there's like an infinite set of things that people do not know, right? And what people don't have is they don't have a lot of time to ponder what they don't know, what they have a lot of time, what they're doing with their time is they're trying to do things that they know how to do and trying to figure out how to do them better. But it's a very, um, you know, pragmatic, I need to get this done kind of, uh, kind of um, engagement. And so I think um, from a researcher's perspective, whose job it is to ask questions, um, when you're engaging with policy, I think one of the things you need to do is to help them ask questions and don't assume that they're going to know what the important questions are for you um, that they want answers to. There needs to be kind of a bit of a dialogue to flesh out, like, what are the assumptions behind what they're doing and what are they doing? What are the priorities there? You know, I've, this theme come, has come up over and over again. Time constraints are super important here. And I think that's really what's behind all this demand for translational work, which I've already mentioned is like something I'm not a huge fan and it doesn't solve this problem. It, it just creates another set of, of papers to look through that are a little shorter, um, but that, that don't help people really strongly draw a, a sense of what, what is appropriate research for a particular setting um, and what are the questions that they need to be asking. So be appreciative of those time constraints. Policy is not going to spend a lot of time pondering questions. They're not going to spend a lot of time translating your research for you. Um, I think partnerships more broadly are impractical. You know, all the time we're trying to do um, funded research through uh, partnerships. Um, cooperative agreements. But ultimately, the people that are on the other side of those cooperative agreements, not the research side, but the policy side, are super busy. And they're doing everything they can just to manage that, um, that, that contract, let's say. And so um, I think you as a researcher, when you're engaging policymakers, I think it's just, it's impractical to expect them to be full partners. What you're hoping for in that virtual coffee is to get people interested, get people excited, and to help people help you identify questions, but they're not gonna be active partners in, in your research going on, even if they, they would like, and even if they would like to be, and probably most would like to be, but um, they just don't have time. And then the other kind of big takeaway um, where I'm gonna spend my last few minutes is um, the language that we use matters a lot in policy engagement. And here there is a big gap within economics, and I won't presume to speak to other disciplines, but within economics, there's a big gap between the language we use in writing our research papers for an academic audience and how policy thinks of different concepts related to child labor. Okay, and I want to end with sort of giving you my sense of where we are right now in terms of how can we define the things that we're talking about? How can we use language that will both satisfy an academic audience and translate in a meaningful, not misleading way to policy? Because the second that, you know, your partner feels that you're being misleading, you know, that conversation is completely over. And there's a lot of scope for that right now, given the differences in terminology between what's used in academic writing and what policy really means. And a lot of that confusion um, revolves around something called the production boundary that's defined in the UN system of national accounts. Um, and when we start talking about child labor, definitions of what is child labor and what is, child, what is not child labor wind up into different concepts of a production boundary. Broadly speaking, there's kind of the like general production boundary and the production boundary of the SNA, or maybe we might call that the economic production boundary. Um, these are distinct in international conventions regarding the definition of child labor, and I find them super confusing. So I want to spend just a minute clarifying the difference between a general production boundary and the production boundary of the SNA. Basically, it all comes down to how you think about 
own account, and by own, we mean like our family too, our household anyway, where we live. Um, our own account production of household services is treated differently between the two. The general production boundary is kind of like everything you do that translates your time that you're endowed with into goods and services that enter into your own well being in some way. The production boundary, the SNA, says, all right, we're not going to include unpaid household services within that concept, but otherwise we'll be more or less the same. Why is there this exclusion of unpaid household services? Um, you know, I think broadly the right thing to do is that there's a there's there's you know a broad sense that like if I'm cooking or cleaning for my household or weeding in my garden, that's not like adding to the economy, right? And so really what they're trying to do in defining these different concepts of the production boundary is exclude from the economic production boundary or the production boundary of the SNA stuff that basically I produce and consume just for myself instantly that doesn't affect the rest of the economy. I think that's the basic goal. Is, you know, then there's a lot of, you can look at this up on Google if you want, and there's a lot of nuance um, around the, the fact that production and consumption decisions are simultaneous and they're not accruing to other people that is why they wouldn't ever be included in national accounts and so therefore that is not in the production boundary of the SNA, okay? It would be in the general production boundary. So I'm using this arcane language because it keeps coming up in all these child labor um, resolutions. And I know myself when I first listened to this would read and would just see production boundary and I didn't know notice initially that, oh, general production boundary is different than production boundary of the SNA. And it's all about the exclusion of house unpaid household services um, within the production boundary of the SNA, okay? So some language, working children, working children, and by the way, I'm drawing in all of this from the um, International Conference of Labor Statisticians um, uh, 18th resolution concerning child labor statistics, because I, you know, I think that's kind of my basic for, for what, what is policy agreed to here. So working children um, relies on that general production boundary, okay? So this is going to include unpaid household services. This is going to include goods that you produce and consume on your own, um, as well as work that you do outside of your, your own home. This is the broadest concept of work, um, which is a working child. A child is anyone below the age of 18. Okay, notice the headline on these slides, right? Not all working children are child laborers. So I'm not at this point saying you should be concerned that there is a working child. And maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. There's no normative um, judgment thrown on that. These are just um, some proposals about language that'll help us better communicate with policy. Uh, in own use production work, by children, that's also defined within the general production boundary. So that includes goods and services that are for your own use. And I should point out that ICLS doesn't um, define what own means. I think implicitly kind of the way own seems to be interpreted as own is for the child's own use or the child's family's own use. So own is kind of like the people you live with in some sense. Precision on that is a bit of a problem. It's nuance I won't get into. Um, economically active children are, are um, within the production boundary of the SNA. So own use production work, that's including unpaid household service. Economic activity does not include those unpaid household services. Um, I've bolded here one phrase from the ICLS that I find very puzzling. It's slightly different from how academics use it um, in some instances, which is employment. Um, employment within the ICLS definition is referred to as work performed um, for others in exchange for pay or profit, okay? So that is not you producing something that your family is just going to consume. Um, that's going to be outside of your, your residency and you're getting paid um, perhaps in kind for it. Um, so that's kind of very much the when a, uh, a regular person thinks of employment, that's kind of what they're gonna think of first. Um, and that is not how many economists use the word employment. We'll use a broader thing that I think is really more economic activity. But it feels like just in terms of conventional usage, 
And certainly in terms of ICLS, I think we need to change the way some folks, including myself, use the word employment to like better match work that's, that's outside of the home. And there's some other categories that come up that don't really appear too much in research. Now, all of this is not child labor, right? Child labor is work that children are doing that is in some way um, leaves them worse off. And that's actually a pretty intractable definition, okay? Um, every single work, there's a time constraint. So every single amount of time I spend doing something has a cost to it. I'm not doing something else. So there's always costs in terms of work, right? always cost in terms of every activity. So there's no such thing as a costless activity. There's also always benefits. So if we were to find child labor as a working child whose net benefit is, is negative, that's gonna depend a lot on each individual child. And I don't think that that's really practical to implement. And so what we've done instead is we've um, tried to apply um, precise definitions of the circumstances of those work, uh, of that work, to use it, at, to label it um, as child labor. Um, so two subcategories, worse forms of, of child labor other than hazardous work and hazardous work. Um, hazardous work is generally going to reference a specific set of occupations and industries that an individual country has identified as being hazardous for, for children, and it could vary by age. Worst forms of child labor are those things that I think there's not much controversy that, you know, no matter the, the benefit as a society, we don't want to see children involved in slavery, involved in trafficking, prostitution, and the like. So that's our worst forms of child labor, hazardous child labor. Um, we might differentiate within hazardous. You know, sometimes it's hazardous because of the length of hours of work, sometimes because of the circumstances, such as at night, the, the sort of ICLS definition um, allows for separating those out. Uh, we probably won't do that in general, but that is certainly possible. What else goes into child labor? Well, kind of work that's illegal, a work within the SNA production boundary, again, so we're pulling unpaid household services out, um, that's within that production boundary, that's illegal given the local minimum age laws, that would be considered child labor. And then hazardous unpaid services um, generally should be considered child labor based on the ICLS definition, which I think is right. In practice, this is something I think you'd want to be really attentive to the uh, policy partner that you're, you're engaging with. Um, how are they uh, in, in their role thinking about um, unpaid household services? Um, I think more often than not, that doesn't get included within child labor. Really, we try to live, live within the SNA production boundary and the implementation of child labor definitions in practice, even though you know that's wrong. I think in practice, that's often what happens. Okay, so how do we implement this? Um, you know, the Millennium Development, uh, sorry, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, UNICEF has a bunch of definitions of child labor that they're trying to track to see progress on the SDGs. Um, you know, these, I think, from a researcher's perspective, are really not very useful because depending on the child's age, which is measured with air, um, and the intensity of that work in different circumstances, which is also measured with air, we get different definitions as to whether or not you're a child laborer. And I think in a research community, there's just too much fuzziness here for people to, you know, UNICEF has a particular objective here, which is they're trying to track progress on SDGs. As researchers, I think that we really can't use these definitions. Um, there's just too much um, discreteness that doesn't make any sense given the underlying models that are generating behaviors. So what should we do? Well, I think uh, if we can't rely on this kind of SDG implementation of child labor, I think what we should try to do is, is use a bunch of concepts that are kind of universally well-defined and then have something that's appropriate to the local circumstance where our policy partners are working. So what I'd propose is that we use, as we've defined working, own use production work, which includes unpaid household services, economic activity, which moves us from that general production boundary to the SNA production boundary, employed, which is work outside of the family um, for pay or profit. And then all of those are gonna be broadly comparable across different research settings, they allow us, you know, to the extent that we have the same underlying data, they allow us to kind of compare results of different treatments, how they affect employment rates, own unpaid household service rates, et cetera, 
But then to make sure that we're translating our research locally, we have a child labor definition that's appropriate to the local context. And by making it appropriate to the local context, taking into account the local laws, local hazardous work definitions, et cetera, um, we make it policy relevant, but we make it incomparable. It's why UNICEF can't deal with this and their SDG tracking, but we as researchers um, can just understanding that that child labor definition is context specific. Um, and I think we can live with that if we've got these other general things that are, are not so contract specific, context specific. I think we can do the two. Now, the last kind of thing I want to comment on a little bit just for us to think about as we've kind of got this terminology we might use to try to translate our research into something that the policy is going to understand um, and that other researchers will understand is, does it make sense within own use production work to try to distinguish between unpaid household services and own use economic activity? Are these really things that are, that are fundamentally different? If I'm cooking or cleaning in my house, is that really different than weeding in my agricultural field? And the answer is, I don't know, okay? Um, there's kind of two pieces to how I might make a decision about this. One is like, well, do parents or children feel the same about both kinds of work? If they feel the same about both kinds of works, um, so I get you know the same disutility, let's say, as a parent from having my kid clean as I do from having the kid weed, or maybe utility, maybe I like them doing that. If I get the same utility, they're going to have the same implicit cost from having my kids engage in both of them. So they really don't need to be differentiated. Do parents feel the same about these activities? I'm not actually aware of data where we've asked parents or we've asked kids about different kinds of work and got the sense of like, what's more desirable, what's less desirable. I'm certainly aware of some qualitative work around, um, evidence around this, but um, in terms of like, larger scale, nationally representative data where we get a broad sense of how parents feel. I would love to see that, but I don't, I don't know about that. On the cost side, you know, we can kind of look at implicit costs of, of participation in unpaid household services, participation in own use economic activity. Do they really seem to be, have different implicit costs? So I looked in some really detailed data I've got from um, Ajmer of seventh grade girls where I can sort of find out how happy you are in your life. What's your self-esteem like? What's your stress level like? How are you doing in school? And if we compare across these different measures, um, kids who are involved in own use economic activity versus kids that are unpaid in unpaid household services, they don't really don't, I can't at any point reject my null hypothesis that these two different types of activities leave kids feeling about the same about themselves and their environment. They seem to have similar life satisfactions, similar levels of self-esteem. Stress is really hard to measure. It's just all over the map. They seem to go to school similarly. They seem to have similar test scores if they're involved in those two activities. So I feel like for practical definitions in academic research, you know, maybe it's not so important to distinguish between own use economic activity and own use unpaid household services, but I'd love to see a little bit more in that going down the line. So then what am I proposing for academic research, working, own use production work, both of which would include unpaid household services, economic activity, which is work within the SNA production boundary, employed, which is work for pay or profit outside of your home, and then child labor, which is locally appropriately defined and will be meaningful to your policy partner. And I, we don't wanna call economic activity, we don't wanna call own use production work, child labor because not all of those activities are child labor and your policy partner will feel a bit misled. So kind of my basic summary here, how can academic researchers improve the policy impact of their work? Know your reader in the policy sphere, just like you know your reader in the academic sphere and watch your language. Don't call things child labor to policymaker that are not um, child labor, but do make sure you use words that other academic researchers know exactly what you're talking about, know exactly what you mean when you see, um, um, when they see your research. So that's kind of um, my summary of uh, where we, um, how we can improve the policy impact of our, our research. And, you know, I think the, the one takeaway from those of you that are, are not academic researchers that are here is maybe we should look for opportunities to have more of those virtual coffees, get more 
early engagement going, I think everyone's better off if that happens. Lorenzo, there's one um, in the Q&A, I can see someone that has um, uh, posed a question about um, Western bias. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, look at the membership, look, look at the attendees. Um, and um, certainly that's um, when I'm talking about academic research for an academic market, those academic markets are heavily, heavily Western, right? There's just, I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, and I think, but when we think about policy engagement, really what we want to be doing as researchers is be engaging people around the world. And I think that those, to the extent that we can start making those, those coffees, those virtual coffees happen, um, I think, you know, within the structures that are there, we can, we can help make some improvements in that dimension. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm a bit more of an incrementalist um, than, than a revolutionary in, in that way, but I think it's an easy increment um, that can help start broadening things and, and doesn't, you know, rely on radical changes to existing, uh, or existing regimes. Um, Lorenzo, we've got some raised hands. Do you want to moderate that or yeah. do you want me to? Yes. You'll do it? Okay. So, um, Ali, let's go. Yeah. Just turn on your mic and um, ask the question. Uh, yes. Um, this is Ali CDB from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, I think the, I will let the professor to develop questionnaire to develop questionnaires on on baseline survey on child trafficking and child labor, child labor. Yeah, if I if I could use the opportunity to um, just highlight a, another project that I know Lorenzo is leading, um, which is to improve um, and, and develop. Um, uh, our capacity to ask questions around child labor and forced labor and develop a set of standards around those questionnaires, um, et cetera. Um, I'm really excited um, to see how that continues to progress. Yes, let, let me come in. Now I can put in the chat a link uh, to the um, questionnaire that is on child labor that has been uh, Changed a little bit also to answer to the latest uh, ICLS, improved uh, to collect more information that can be useful also for uh, uh, producing research useful for policy making. Um, we have, again, through an international advisory board, and Eric was part, was part of all this process, uh, we we produce these two different questionnaire, but this is not the end. So because of uh, there are many requests also from uh, the academia or the research side and the policy maker from the other side uh, on how we can look at different aspects, which are labor, but this apply to first labor, to trafficking, etc. So questionnaire are always uh, uh, being, uh, <laughs> are always under, development so let me put for you this um, the link there in the chat so that you can see and let's go to the next question in only only please hi um this is holly kugler um i'm a phd student at johns hopkins and i'm also a researcher at icf which is a government contractor so I sort of bridge this um, academic and policy research. I do both sides. And I think your point is really great about the importance of engaging um, policymakers at the, at the beginning. Um, but I, I also find it a challenge. And I brought this up. I think I saw you do a similar presentation recently. I'm not sure where, <laughs> Eric. Um, but it's, it's hard with the timelines that we're given for research on both sides. Um, the, I think that, that engagement with local policymakers, for example, a project we're doing um, in Uganda. So engaging with the government of Uganda, it's very time consuming to set up the meetings, to make the connections. So when we have you know, nine months or six months actually to do the, the research, it's hard to incorporate that. So I think when you're thinking about time, we should also think about the time given for the project overall. Yeah, so, um... 
you know, that's one of the luxuries of academic research as opposed to policy directed research, right? Yeah. Um, is, and, and, and I think I'm really of, of two different differences that you've highlighted. One is that, you know, the standard for engagement that I'm, that I'm encouraging here is like a virtual coffee. It's not, you know, when you're doing policy directed research, you have an engagement report you're writing. There's going to be lots of meetings in country things like that that are all required as a part of your contract. It will vary based on your contract. Um, but um, academic research doesn't have those obligations, right? Um, we're more flexible. We also, we're slower. Yeah. Um, we don't have those same time constraints. And so we can reach out and have a virtual coffee at the beginning of our research project, which we do all the time with our academic research. I never write a paper. I don't begin progressing on a paper until I've talked to you know, five or six people that have been active in that area that'll have some ideas and have some expertise. We're doing that already. We can afford the 15 minutes to talk to, you know, if this is a, a project in Guatemala to try to talk to somebody who's in the labor ministry in Guatemala. Like mm -hmm. we can do that. I don't think it's, I don't think it's really such a burden. I think the sort of reporting issues related to policy directed research are in part like why it's really hard to do policy directed research in a way that's um, not heavily, heavily engaged, dealing with problems of confirmation bias and so on. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do not disagree with anything that you just said on that regard. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, Lorenzo, as we continue, um, one thing I, I thought, I know I'm also monitoring the Q&A here and um, Jennifer Sorensen mm -hmm. has uh, an interesting question in there about like, well, how, how can we make this happen in an institutionalized way, right? Because I'm sort of like, at the moment, kind of pushing a very informal structure. But I think um, I think like a more formalized structure, you know, which uh, I, I would love to try to, to be involved in, in generating um, would kind of, you know, I think part of what we need is just better information. We can't really rely on LinkedIn to find out who's in every labor ministry in every country, right? Um, whereas, you know, the ILO, uh, UNICEF, um, variety of different bilateral um, and, um, and country agencies do kind of have a lot of information um, as to who they engage with. And so if there are a way to facilitate that, you know, through a very simple online clearinghouse, for example, where we can find people that are willing to spare a 15 minute conversation, um, I think that would help get this going. Um, and it would naturally be embedded, you know, we've tried in the past to hold these big matchmaking events at the ILO, I think in 1999, I was in one where there were like 500 people in a room, um, which was just too much, but something more modest where I can look and find out, you know, who's involved in child labor policy in, in Honduras um, that might be willing to have a cup of coffee with me as I begin my Honduran project. I think that would make a lot of sense. And it's modest. I mean, and it's, sometimes it's hard to do modest things, right? That's not a very expensive thing to do. It requires a low level of commitment for a very long time though. Um, and that, that can be really hard. So I, I'll let, let people smarter than I figure out how to do that. But I, it doesn't seem like it's a hard thing to do. Um, Eric, uh, to add on this, this is really a good point. Uh, uh, I don't know also if this uh, can help, but from our experience in developing the research agenda at country level, so bringing together uh, representative from the academia, uh, from the Ministry of Labor Education, so from government, uh, practitioner uh, from international organization, few people, but staying together and talking and going through and see which are the issue of the country in that case, uh, and what is needed, what, what, which are the needs of the policymaker in terms of research, which are also the needs of, of the academia <laughs> while producing research, uh, and how they can help uh, in producing research, uh, and how the international community also can help. Uh, this has been incredibly useful also for us to understand which are really the steps to be done at the country level, how to engage uh, policy actors since the beginning in this uh, discussion. And like Eric was saying at the beginning, maybe this is not, uh, uh, the research at the end will not be the type of research uh, that will be published on a journal but will be a type of research useful for the country. So I think this we need to keep in mind also the, the extinction. Uh, as coming from the academia, we need to we tend to uh, write things in a way 
and using models and econometric approach that can be appealing for journals. Um, we need, in this case, I think we need to think a little bit differently, as Eric was saying really at the beginning of his uh, presentation. Yeah, I mean, to underscore that, the cost of a virtual coffee might be that you need to write something um, in addition to your academic paper that, that, that feels more helpful to, to your partner so that you have a, you know, you, it's not, you know, if you're, if you're taxing someone for a virtual coffee, it may impose some costs on you yourself. And um, that seems only fair. Um, another uh, hand, uh, Edmond, I don't know, apparently it seems uh, is an older version of uh, Zoom. I can give you the, um, the floor. Do you mind uh, typing the question on the Q&A? And uh, Prachi, I'm giving the, the floor to you, Prachi. Hi, hi, Eric, hi, Lorenzo. Uh, this is Prachi Bansal from India. Um, Eric, my question is that I was recently working on child labor and uh, I, I, from, you know, from different countries, uh, especially Latin American countries and Sub-Saharan African countries, the content that is available even in academic research is not in English. It's in different languages. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to, um, you, you know, you find very few, um, the, the gap is very much. For example, if you would research things for countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, you get to know a lot. But for uh, Cameroon, Sub-Saharan African countries where this problem is much greater, the kind of research, the output that we have is very limited. Although there is a lot of work, but it's not very widely, um, you know, uh, it's not very widely disseminated. How do we bridge this gap? I mean, first, first of course, there's translations, but I mean, uh, how do we reach out to those labor ministries and those people with, you know, there's that language gap, which is very much evident. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So. Um... All of my focus on translational research was not on the literal translation of the research. It was more on the uh, within language um, simplification. You know, translational research often ends up meaning simplification. But what's really valuable is when it when it's helping communicate across language barriers and, and the like. And you know, I mean, I think if I, I don't have any solution for you, um, uh, you know, it, the diversity of languages in the world is something that's like one of the, it does become hard for communication, but it's um, also uh, one of the things that makes it an interesting place and makes it valuable to learn the language, you know. I certainly share your frustration. I've tried to do work in Mozambique uh, for so long now um, with just, you know, an inability to um, build partnerships there because yeah. um, I don't, I, I can't, I'm, not adept at handling the language. Um, and um, I, you know, I share I, I share that frustration. There's missing opportunities. But you know, Lorenzo and his team and, and uh, you know also like Lorraine's team in IOM, there are a lot of international organizations that do try to help spread learning across international boundaries. Um, you know, that's part of their mission. But you know, it's it's you got to learn the language when you're working somewhere in a lot of places. Yeah, for sure. No, no way around that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Very much. Just, just one minute. Uh, there is a um, last question from uh, the chat from Fernanda. Talking about the informal waste sector, what would be the best wording for intermittent or not consistent on use production work? Will it be implied within on use production that this is an activity not carried out 52 weeks per year? Yeah, so that's that's an issue I kind of skipped over, which is recall, right? Um, and um, when you look within the ICLS definition, um, they also kind of just, um, uh, make it attuned to what's the recall period for the survey. So you might refer to um, own use production work in the last seven days if you have a survey that's collecting in the last seven days. Um, you know, if you're dealing with survey data that's asking about activities over the previous year, and, um, you know, I think that adding a modifier that makes it clear 
you know, how you're defining things, but using a phrase like own use production that we understand um, is probably the best thing that we can do in terms of communication. But with different survey instruments that have different recall periods, especially when they're different recall periods for different activities, you know, that is um, just a degree of uh, heterogeneity across contexts that we need to make sure we're clear about in, in our writing and our communication. Not very satisfying, I know, but I mean, <laughs> sometimes the data you have is the data you have. So we are on time, Eric. Thank you so much. I see there are other messages coming. Okay, it's more for it to, to connect. Eric, really, thank you so much for your time, for your thoughts. Um, I have uh, one question on this. Uh, and that we can discuss them. We will have the time and other occasion to discuss so on the on use production and uh, Azul chores, because there there is the complication of that Azul chores should be hazardous and paid Azul services to be included in the definition of child labor, which is very difficult uh, to measure. You know, we, Hey, one little that. reprimand on that comment, Lorenzo, right? Like household chores does not appear in any of the ICLS uh, definitions. So I think we want to, we might distinguish between hazardous unpaid household services and unpaid household services, but I think the household chore language gets very confusing very quickly. Um, exactly. And so I, I, I might, I might encourage you not to use that, um, especially in the context of trying to clarify language a little bit. Um. <laughs> exactly, because yeah. we were adding, you know, then when translating the issue commonly called as chores, because the change in the language doesn't help also during uh, this year. So there, uh, I mean, yeah, we have to be precise. And these are the difficulties to the country level, because difficult to measure, international level, we come up uh, um, to a definition for the young children, five to 13 years old, if a person is doing more than 21 hours per week in Azul chores, we can classify, we can say that is hazardous and classify as being child labor, which is the definition of the SDG. Uh, so just a call for research that we need. We don't know still how to classify those in the age group 15 to 17 that are carrying out lots of Azul chores as uh, hazardous Azul chores. Because there is a threshold for those that are in work, which is 43 hours. Uh, we should find a way, I mean, to define them that combine the two Azul chores and uh, Activity. This is a big open question. Yeah, you know, and I would caution a little bit, Lorenzo, that sort of some of the, uh, the the issues that your office has to deal with in terms of comparing things across countries um, might be different than the the constraints and the issues okay. that say, like I as an academic researcher face. And I think like my proposal, uh, which is targeted at academic researchers. Right, is that we use a common set of language, a common set of items when we can define them. And then we have child labor that's locally appropriate to the context for our policy partners. And more often than not, Lorenzo, as you know, like unpaid household services will probably not be included within what a labor ministry views child labor as being for its given country. And I think like for someone like you who's tasked with the mission of creating cross-country comparisons, um, that creates one problem for a researcher um, who's trying to build a relationship. I think it's more important um, that we produce research that's valuable in that context yeah. um, for that child labor definition. And then we've got the other categories that are suitable for cross-country comparison. But, you know, you got to be attentive to your policy market. Um, and unfortunately, though unpaid household services absolutely should be within a definition of child labor um, in most countries in the world, it seems like it's not. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, I noticed within the chat as we're running down here, there are a ton of people that are like asking for communication information and things like that. Um, you know, for me personally, I'm really easy to Google Eric Edmonds, Dartmouth College. You're going to find my website and my email address and all that. But is there going to be a broader like conference participant list that's sent out or anything like that? I don't know. 
we can um, after the conference we can see whether if everyone agree which are the details we can make public um, yeah the not, folks who are trying to contact can, me you know yeah eric edmonds dartmouth college i'm it that's let's all there see. is let's see